Welcome to Turning the Page. I'm host Donnie Morris, owner of Confetti Antiques and Books. And we're here today with Luann Staley, who has co-authored a book that many of you may be familiar with the uh, biographies of this book. And it is When Hearts Conjoin, the uh, Heron Conjoined Twin Story. Great book. I've absolutely loved how uh, you intertwined or interwoven the story of the mother and the, the sisters, or the daughters rather, all together. Thank you. I thought it was important to have the mother's story told, that it was, that was the, the hook that brought you into this family that really gave you an understanding of the mother's heart and how she cared about her children and, and why she wanted to go ahead and carry these babies even though the doctors had warned her that there were going to be a lot of difficulties with having conjoined twins. Aaron, the mother, 18 years old, still in high school, gets pregnant, has her first daughter, kind of a, I don't want to say shotgun wedding, but, you know, same right. kind of thing. Uh, not the best way to start a marriage. They're still young. She's, what, 19, I think, when she gets pregnant with the twins. Right. So here they are. I've been married a year. She has one child, and she's pregnant with more with another with a set of twins and the whole time Erin knows something's wrong she just knows that something's not right exactly and it's what I think she's three or four months along before she really right. finds out that she's having twins and it's that that dreadful silence I think when you're sitting there at the doctors and they're they're doing the sonogram and all of a sudden they say just a moment I need to get somebody else exactly Oh, boy, that's just got to tear your heart out as a mother. Yeah, she's, she said that uh, when they had that particular sonogram, they were, you know, they, she and Jake were kind of laughing and talking and, and having a good time with each other. They'd, they'd been separated for a little while, and so to be back together was kind of fun. And then the um, sonographer, as she's looking at the screen, all of a sudden is just, dead quiet and says I need to go and have somebody else come in and that's when they found out the news that's that, when they found out the news that, that the they, twins were conjoined two heartbeats right but they're too close together I, uh, that's, yeah it, yeah but you know as you said Aaron had just felt you know everybody kept saying no they're not twins the earlier tests had not shown any indication of twins and they just felt that she just felt that there was something something different about this pregnancy than the previous pregnancy and of course she, she was, was right, right. <laughs> she was right there are lots of things different yes. about this pregnancy than the previous pregnancy was. well many of us here in utah had an opportunity to see a lot of this in the news the book goes into so much more detail there is so much that people don't have any idea that the family had to go through that the, that the, the girls went through I mean, the news stories just weren't enough. Right. Right. And, and uh, you know, the news, the purpose of the news is to sell the quick story, to find the sound bite, to, you know, just have that, that one little kernel and not to necessarily go into the whole family. And um, the Herons themselves, early on, didn't know how much they wanted to share oh. with, with people, with the news. As a matter of fact, the girls had actually been born and were several months old before they even allowed anything on the the news about them and then once um, that happened they were amazed by how the community and you know all of Utah and then eventually all of the world have embraced them now, as a family speaking about the news mm -hmm. you write for our local newspaper I do I write for the local uh, for the Spanish Fork press and I have written in the past for the Spanish Fork news as well but I continue with the Spanish Fork press I write a newspaper column called Read All, Read All About It. Okay. Yeah. I've actually seen your article, and yeah. I'm glad to have finally met you. Yeah, that's so good, too. So the, the news, they pick up the sound bites, as you say, mm -hmm. the, the, a little bit of the story. But this story now, I mean, the girls are, how old are they now? Seven. Seven. The book is written. It's about their separation, about right. the, 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 the early life of the mother, the right. marriage. What's happening with the story now? Where is it going now? Yeah, well, right now, um, you know, it's, it's still a national news story. They just did a TLC special. 
okay. that has, has been on television this week. Um, they may possibly, they've been on Oprah several times in the past, and there's a possibility of them going back on Oprah. But as far as, you know, with them, and, and the book does talk about this, they're in the process right now of being fitted for their prosthetic legs. And so the girls are learning how to walk and how to get around. It gives them much more mobility than what they've had before. They're, they're up and they can walk, but they're on a walker. And as one of their doctors um, said, that right now, basically what we have is each girl has one leg, and that's their only usable limb because their hands are being taken up with having oh. to be able to hold themselves, balance themselves on the walker. And so they really only have the one leg. As soon as they get them up and balanced well on, on both legs, suddenly they have hands as well as oh. legs and feet to be able to use. So that will be yet another miracle in their life that they are able to get around better. Now, I think that's of one of that. the points of the book. As you go through it, you see throughout the mother's life, Erin's life, or her pregnancies, and the, the, the daughters being born, and all the, mer the medical things they had to go through, miracle after miracle. Exactly. Uh, just, exactly. It, it's just, it just tears at your heart, really. I mean, as, as you read the story and you, and you find out about them, you really get to know these people. Right. I think you've done just a fantastic job oh, of, of bringing those people to life in, in the book. Thank you. And I've never met them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yet you feel like you I do. I feel like I have. I, and I've heard that from a lot of people that after they get done with this book, they thought they knew something about the Herons because they'd seen those little one-minute film clips. But after they get done with the book, they feel like they're intimate friends with the Heron family and that they found out that there is so much more about this family that, you know, as you say, are miracles exactly. that happen all the time with them. And they feel that real connection and want to know more about not only Aaron but the girls and, and their other children as well, about um, Courtney and the, the two twin boys that they have. Sure. Um, does she have a lot of marital support? Honestly, no. She and Jake had been having some difficulty uh. with each other, trying to decide whether they were even going to stay together or not. You know, it was it was a rough... A rough time for her and although you know he was supportive enough to come and take her to doctor's appointments and do those kinds of things they were still having a great deal of difficulty deciding if they were going to remain a couple and she was faced with you know what am I going to do well, if I remember right she was working for seven eight dollars an hour exactly didn't know how to make the house payment yeah she had to go to his sister I think it was to would you ask Jake if he would Right, Help she didn't out. didn't feel comfortable, you know, going right to Jake right then. They were having communication problems as well, and so she did. She, you know, she used his his family to help her. So they're separated. Go. Then what happens? Well, then they go to the doctor and they find out that not only do they have twins, but that the twins are conjoined, and the immediate message from all of the doctors, all the the suggestions is that we should abort these babies because they don't have a good a good possibility for a continued life that it would just be best and Aaron and Jake have that huge decision to make what do they want to do where are they going where are they going to go from now and they don't have you know because they are separated right now they don't have each other there as quite the support system as they might need now a big test like through. this in your life is going to either separate you or pull you together. Exactly. And so you really need to pick up the book and read it to find out how the Herons handle this and, and what exactly they do with it. Now, we're going to go to commercial. I'm host Donnie Morris, and we're here with, with Luann Staley. Come back and join us again. Welcome back to Turning the Page. I'm host Donnie Morris of Confetti Antiques and Books, and I'm here with Luann Staley, who has co-authored the when hearts conjoin the heron twins the conjoined twins from salt lake their story luann how did you get the story where did it come from well you know like most people here in utah i had actually seen news clips on the herons throughout their whole life and thought wow you know what a what a story wouldn't that be a great story to tell and then um, i had the opportunity to speak at a conference that was being hosted by author richard paul evans okay. of the christmas box and 
I heard Erin there and she got up and gave a pitch for this book. At the time, they had someone in their family who was going to write the book. Okay. And as they got started, uh, well, even before that, when I heard the pitch, I thought, wow, I wish I could write that story. And the family member got started on the book, apparently, and I kind of put it aside. I was off doing other projects and didn't think about it. And then that family member fell through. And so Rick... And one of his associates came and asked me if I would be interested Rick, in doing Richard, Richard Pollitt, Pollitt. Okay. exactly, if I would be interested in doing this project. And I was just, yes, I would love to. But then I had an accident and couldn't write for a little while. I had broken my arms. Oh, really? <laughs> so, you know, you can't quite sit at the computer and type very well when you've got a broken elbow and broken arm. And so they had gone to someone else that I knew. And I, I know this woman, and I thought, wow, this is going to be great. And when she started to write it, it was more of a clinical book. She was interviewing doctors and, and getting things that were much more just, this is what happened, this is what the conjoined twin situation is like. And Aaron said, this isn't quite the story that I want to tell. And so when I had healed a little bit, I did a sample chapter for her, and she read it and said, that's my story. That's what I want. And so, you know, from the beginning of wishing that I could write this story until the time that I got to, it was my own little miracle oh. because I went through a lot of things myself and yet I was able to pull this book off and now you put actually it together have, with her. You have a pretty good set of credentials. Um, you're an English teacher at Payson right. Junior High. Right. You've won numerous awards. Exactly. Tell us a few of the awards that you've won. Well, um, in 2008, I was Utah's uh, Teacher of the Year, Educator of the Year from Best of State. And I have previously won the um, Utah's English Language Arts Teacher of the Year. I was the Nebo School District Reading Teacher of the Year from the Nebo Reading Council. And I'm a Krista McCullough Fellow. I'm not familiar with that. What's that? It's it's a national award. A national award. A national award for an outstanding educator, and I did a project on literacy, that I went back to Washington D.C. and presented, to the Krista McAuliffe Foundation. Of course, Krista McAuliffe was the school teacher who was in the oh, Challenger uh, tragedy. Yes, oh, okay. exactly. Great. Well, n no wonder the book is well written. Oh, yeah, well, thank you. It, it is superb. It thank really you. is. Um, tell me just a moment, or tell the audience. How is it you found me? How did I find you? I saw that you were having people down to do an autograph party next have... week for Fiesta Days. And I thought, I have a book and I live in Spanish Fork and maybe I should go find out a little bit more about Confetti Antiques. And, and so we came in and had a nice conversation and Next thing we know, I, I, I picked your book up on Friday. By Saturday morning I had read it. Uh, I stayed up till 2 a.m. to read it. I was totally enthralled and I loved it. And I, I was excited to, to have this opportunity to talk with you. And I want to tell the audience, we are this coming weekend, Saturday the 18th, Monday the 20th, and Tuesday the 21st. We're having our 30 authors in one place in three days to come down. And we're going to have 30 different authors signing books. It's going to be quite an event for Fiesta Day. So we want to get the entire community out, come out. She'll be here. So you're going to be here Monday, Monday from noon, noon to, to 4. To four. Signing copies of the book. You can talk to her about the book. Um, this is going to just be a wonderful time for everyone. Um, wh where else can they pick the book up at? Well, we can get it here at Confetti Antiques, or you can get it online at the Confetti Antiques um, website. Sure. Or you can get it at utahtwins.com. Okay. Um, anything else you'd like to add today? Um, you know, Donnie mentioned that, that he started the book and then he stayed up until late to read the book. I've heard that from everyone who's, who's read the book, that it has grabbed at their hearts to the point that they are just sitting down and they think, oh, I'll just get started. And the next thing they know, they finish the book. They, a straight through setting with the book. So when you get the book, plan on a couple hours to sit down and, and just read. Before we wrap it up, I wanted to, the, the title of the book, When Hearts Can Join, mm -hmm. can you tell us a little bit about that? Um, when they very first found out that the girls were conjoined, they couldn't tell what exactly inside, because, you know, you're doing an ultrasound, it's, 
it's very difficult yeah through the mother and whatever and so Aaron was actually a little bothered by the doctor because he kept saying that the babies are just mush that they couldn't couldn't tell anything and then obviously they didn't really know what all the girls shared until they were born Mm. so during those first few years of their lives prior to their being separated the doctors were doing lots of tests and you know things to see what they had and they were pretty certain that the girls shared the kidney and um the bladder and there was one other liver the liver yeah that, that they shared you know some organs but that's all that they really thought when they got however in the middle of this 26 hour landmark surgery they discovered that there was a little bit more than what they had anticipated so that was conjoined as well one kidney for two people. One functioning kidney. And luckily, the liver, I understand, just before they started, they realized that the liver had started splitting. Mm-hmm. So that so they were able to. They, they, they were able to separate that. So each girl had a liver, but only one girl ended up with a kidney. You can't live without a kidney, can you? So what did Malia do? No, you can't live without a kidney. And so that's one of the things that you'll find out in the book, what happened with Malia and how she's managed to survive. It, it's... A pretty big miracle, really. It is. It's a huge miracle. It really is. Luann, we want to thank you for coming in. This is a great story, and we really recommend it to the audience. Please come down to Confetti Antiques and Books, pick up a copy. Monday, Luann will be here signing copies, and we really want to have you here. Come down. um, Great opportunity to to read the story. When Hearts Can Join by Luann Staley and Aaron Heron. And just want to remind all of you that proceeds from the sale of this book do go into a medical trust fund to help pay for the surgeries, the continued surgeries that Kendra and Malia have had throughout their life and will continue to have. Great. And if you really want to, for a special price, you can pick up, you can pre-order rather, sign copies from the girls. They will sign copies of the book for you as well. So again, thank you for coming in and thank thank you you for for joining us. Antiques and Books at 273 North Main Street here in Spanish Fork. And today we have Craig Foster with us who has written his book called A Different God. And it's concerning Mitt Romney's race for the presidential office. Um, He's here today signing the books and answering a few questions. And we'll be having some of those books available in the store afterward. So if you'd like to come down and take a look at those, that would be great. Craig? I have been interested in history and politics for quite a while, particularly where it has to do with the LDS Church. And so about a year ago, I was talking with a friend, and we talked about writing a book together on Mitt Romney. And from that, uh, it actually turned into a book about other uh, Latter-day Saints or people connected in one way or to another with the LDS Church that have uh, run for president of the United States. That book, co-authored with my friend Newell Bringhurst, is titled The Mormon Quest for the Presidency. But to be honest, I wrote so much about Mitt Romney that um, only a small portion ended up in that book. And so I thought, I have enough here for another book. And uh, I then fleshed it out a little bit more and uh, came up with the book, A Different God. It, um, it was intense writing. My family began to wonder if I was uh, going to ever talk to them again. The, the book, A Different God, is about Mitt Romney and his presidential campaign. And it looks at what I call the Mormon question. And I guess I'm not alone in calling it the Mormon question. There have been other people who have asked, basically, Um, Can the uh, voters uh, here in the United States, can they trust a Mormon to be president of the United States? Or 
are they afraid that uh, this Mormon president will follow, you know, what Salt Lake City tells him to do? Basically, be kind of like um, a Catholic listening to the Pope in the Vatican type thing. And so I focused, uh, the, the book focuses on that question and on basically anti-Mormon bigotry that um, appeared uh, on the left and on the right politically. And I focus in the book on the religious right um, because Mitt Romney was running as a Republican and that is a powerful uh, voting block within the Republican Party. But there were also, there were, were examples of religious bigotry from, from the left, certainly. And I do mention those. So far, not a lot of negative need, uh, feedback. So far, uh, the feedback has been pretty good, although uh, there have been a few, I've noticed a few comments in different periodicals, uh, particularly by those who feel like uh, they're being mentioned in the book, um, you know, that have been a little bit negative. Uh, there are people who um, are, are, you know, groups that obviously I focus on, such as evangelicals in the religious right. And uh, there have been uh, a few comments of wondering where this book is going. I have been writing books and articles uh, for a while. I, I should say I've been writing mostly articles. This is my third book, but I have been writing articles for at least 20 years or so. Most of the articles have to do with aspects of LDS history, although some of my articles kind of branch out into other aspects of, of Western and social history.